door in the Bonfield Gallery. Um, and I just want to thank you all for coming and being curious about my work here. So the plan is that we will start here with a few background images and notes on what is important to me with my work. Then we will move to the Bonfield Gallery where we can look at the work itself and get more into the details. At that time, I will rely on your questions and observations and I can clarify anything from these images. 
So before we launch in, I want to just thank Liz for inviting me to exhibit my work at Crooked Tree Art Center. It seems very appropriate that my work is here because I draw a lot of crooked trees, <laughs> which you're going to see. Um, so you and your team have been a lot of fun to work with, Liz, Lissa, um, coming to get my work down in Detroit, um, and also pulling together some workshops. Um, Liz has been amazing and sort of bringing in all different, my different bodies of work um, that sometimes can seem incongruous, but they're all from me. So, um, and Ben Cheney at the Croft Dance Residency was really essential in making that happen too. Um, and also to Bill and Sue Kelso and the Good Heart Residency for inviting me to stay and work for two glorious weeks up north starting now. I moved in yesterday rearrange the studio, um, which will be open on Saturday. If you wanna come see it, um, I'll be there on Saturday as well. And it's a beautiful space. I feel like a queen. Um, their feet, Joanne Stewart is feeding me. Um, my husband stayed with me last night. I don't think he wants to leave today. <laughs> um, so yeah, but Bill and Sue, how many people on this planet open their hearts and homes to artists like you do? <laughs> it's really uh, incredible the value and belief you're placing in your artists and residents and I'm so appreciative and I'm sure I will have more to say about the value of this time and place in two weeks. Oh, let's see. I can't see. Here, I'll get this. Got it. Bear with me a minute. Oh no. Oh, okay, should I use that? No, it'll be fine. okay. Um, so the motivating question in my work is how do beauty and survival coexist? So to clarify these terms, beauty does not mean pretty to me. My definition leads more towards the sublime, terror, beauty, complexity, mystery, the marvelous, seen and unseen all rolled into one, oftentimes causing overwhelming emotions and physical reactions. Beauty causes sensations that make us pay attention to it and actively seek it out. Survival is what we do to make our lives, to hold on to our lives with all our might and to make it the best we can for ourselves within the circumstances of living our lives. Oops, shoot. I'm sorry, I'm not used to this computer. Um, for me, beauty is essential. Making art has become the infrastructure for me to do that. I do not separate the making of my art from my life. Making art is a lifestyle I have chosen because as a young girl, I realized that attempting to create beauty and participating in beauty was the pinnacle of existence. I wanted everything to do with that endeavor. I do not believe art is the only way to live a beautiful survival, but that was the past path before me and I took it for better or for worse. I also feel my art making is just something I do. It's like laundry or making dinner or teaching. It's something that I do to survive. I find these activities incredibly satisfying on many levels, but mostly in my studio. My hope is that you will find some satisfaction in my work as well. Now to set the stage a little more, so bear with me. <laughs> I consider myself a phenomenologist of sorts. Phenomenology is termed by Robert Sokolowski as a kind of descriptive analysis of consciousness. The consciousness I am honed into is our experience of beauty. For me, I'm both a maker of beauty and an active participant in beauty. So these are the more specific questions I ask myself. How do experiences with beauty work? How do they play upon us and affect our lives? What is that mysterious sensation that an interaction with beauty creates within us? How can I participate with beauty as much as possible to make my survival the best it can be? How can I inspire others to consider their survival as beautiful, to seek beauty, and even to make beauty themselves? So 
So this piece, Finish the Spring, is my latest attempt to answer these questions. This is Swansea Beach Park, a handwoven drawing. It is a diptych and is of a typical tree in Oahu, Hawaii, where my son now lives and where I get to visit him, his wife and their dog, Lucy. He is a first lieutenant in the army. I will get more into the details of these works as we spend time together. I'm a Great Lakes girl, and I think there's probably lots of Great Lakes people here. Um, my fondest memories are growing up on Lake Michigan with my grandparents and friends. The beaches of Lake Michigan are the places I consider home and a regular place I go to participate in beauty. Not only are the sights amazing, but it is also physical. The weather, the sand, the swimming, the smell of the air, the heat, and the cold. <laughs> The Michigan woods also inspire me. A theme that runs through all my work is vertical and parallel lines that could be interpreted as abstractions of the forest. Trees are also the main image that I draw and manipulate. In an article that came out this spring in the New York Times, it was reported that some neuroscientists are exploring the possibility that geometry is a language that only humans know. I think of this drive to abstract nature into simpler shapes that we can understand is critical to our, survive, our species survival. Abstracting nature is true in my work and also in regards to the history of human civilization, especially architecture and infrastructure. Architecture is another love of mine and my favorite books to read are usually the writings of architects. <laughs> Here you can see a comparison between the organic form of the woods with the geometric interior of a cathedral. Hopefully this is not a new comparison for you, but it is one that continues to fascinate me. As a young girl while visiting various cathedrals and various monuments, I learned about humans striving to create beauty through art, architecture, and infrastructure. It was where survival and making beauty intermingled into one effort. Through abstraction, people figured out how to mimic natural forms to construct some of our greatest achievements. Here is Teotihuacan in Mexico. And from this perspective, the pyramid is the same size and shape of the mountain behind. In the cathedral, you have an interactive space a space that acts upon you physically when you enter. It is an incredibly holistic experience that deliberately rewards all the senses. I love being in cathedrals and have taken clues from these experiences. My formal education included a BA in philosophy from Wheaton College, a BFA in drawing and painting at the University of Colorado. And this is where I began to create large scale installations. While in Denver, I sought out abandoned storefronts to create installation art. This work pictured here was called the Latias Project, and it entailed suspending 300 aspen wood trunks called Latias from the ceiling, making a surreal forest you could immerse yourself within. People walk through the Latias, the wood clunked together, clunk together in a chain reaction, and each latia was sculpted with points on the bottom that drew in the sand that we covered the floor with. Then I earned an MFA in fiber from the Cranbrook Academy of Art um, in 2003. Here I suspended 400 hankies in a 10 foot by 10 foot space that people could walk within, were surrounded and caressed by the hankies like floating through a cloud. So as I was turning my life towards becoming an artist, I was also becoming a mother. These two things happened almost simultaneously. My boys are a huge influence on my work as I observed how they threw themselves pell-mell into life. They learned things in a physical way, feeling the edges of their bodies. They were not just enjoying looking at things, they were fully in all their senses, soaking up the fullness of learning in any way possible. 
And now that I think about it, they still are in their 20s. <laughs> and this is the cause of some of my silver hairs. <laughs> I wanted to make art to accommodate their way of experiencing the world. I did not want to say no to them when they approached my works of art. I wanted them to touch it and not be afraid of breaking it. I wanted it to be beautiful and durable for them to experience how they would the playground or a sandbox. This was really exciting and thrilling territory for my work. This work is called Reach and was installed at McAllister College in St. Paul. And I've created several of these installations over the years. They are created with clear elastic, commonly used as bra straps that stretch between the ceiling and floor. They use parallel lines that interact with the existing architecture. They appear and disappear as they play with the light. Here you can see the possibility for interaction and involving the whole body in the work. The setting of this particular piece makes it appear like one is walking through a waterfall. This work was made in 2005. This piece is called Turn because the lines meandered, meandered through the gallery in a curvilinear path. This installation was made in 2013, was composed of 400 elastic lines that you could follow like you would a fence. The walls of elastic could be stretched apart and walked through. So the barriers are translucent and flexible to movement and touch. When the pathways intersected, they created little chambers that you can enter by splitting apart the elastic and stepping through it. This piece and earlier work called Three Loves, here you can see the extremes that this material can be pulled. How many pieces of artwork can you grab, snap, punch, walk through, and it'd be okay. So in this exhibition, we have one installation work called Multipluses that you can do that with, but for Liz's sake, do it gingerly, please. <laughs> <laughs> While on a residency at Haystack Mountain School of Craft in 2018, I created sculptures called movables. They are small versions of the larger installations and could fit in my suitcase. They are meant to be manipulated with the hands and go with you places. This one incorporates sounds when the little beads hit the wood on their way down. Get it. Then I can walk around with them and place them in various environments but my favorite is the forest. Oops, went too far, okay. Which has inspired me to bring these abstractions back into their original place of inspiration. I still have a lot of work I want to pursue with this body of work in particular. But let's move on to what I call the handwoven drawings, which are also heavily reliant on vertical and parallel lines for their structure even if it is less obvious. I want to emphasize that I was making the installation work before I began weaving and teaching weaving for my living. So I am the head of the Kingswood Weaving Studio at Cranbrook Upper School. The studio is the largest hand weaving studio in North America and houses 60 floor looms. This is my day job. Here is just one section of the studio in our collection of Cranbrook looms. Cranbrook looms were invented in this space in a collaboration between Henry Bexell and Loya Saarinen, who is very important to why we are still teaching weaving at Cranbrook. I have been teaching weaving here for 19 years, <laughs> and this fact has been a huge influence on my work. I almost feel like weaving asked me to marry her and I accepted. In the Singulars exhibition, you see this partnership loud and clear. It is an original merger between drawing and weaving that makes the work singular. In the past, when creating the large scale installations, I was dependent on spaces and other people to help me. Later, with a very limited schedule to create work, 
I turned to drawing as a form of making that waited for me and was always available to work on, even if it was only 10 minutes while I waited for the pasta to boil. I was teaching full time, raising boys, working in the Cranbrook dorms and making, trying to make art. I needed every minute when the energy was there. So drawing became a lifesaver for me because as my husband knows, I don't exist very well when I'm not making work. <laughs> the abandoned series of drawings are the result of this time period and making in every available moment. Returning to drawing was an incredible gift to me at that time. I developed the concept and unique method of the handwoven drawings during a sabbatical year from teaching in 2015. When originally given the opportunity to teach weaving, I saw it as a way to merge many of my various interests, drawing being one of them. So one of my driving questions during the sabbatical was how could I merge weaving and drawing in a way that was fresh and light, not heavy like a typical historical tapestry and even lighter than the new computerized jacquard weavings we see so much of now. Living in metropolitan Detroit, where graffiti and murals on the walls of existing architecture are celebrated, I wanted to make weavings that had a comparable, spontaneous, fresh, and provocative aesthetic. How could I make a weaving that only I could make? For me, it was through my own hands drawing the imagery. So I developed this new method where I draw on soft wood, cut it into strips with an X-Acto knife, and weave it back together, similar to strip or ribbon weaving. This work pictured here is of my dear friend and mentor, Gerhard Nodell, who also used this strategy of strip weaving in one of his many incredible bodies of work. I him, owe him so much as an artist. His strip weaving strategies stayed within textile soft materials and traditional textile production techniques of screen printing and weaving. In these works, he carefully screen prints photographic imagery onto cotton tape before it is woven. There's no cutting apart like I do. Rather, it's all beautifully orchestrated and put together. I was fascinated by these works of his, studied them, and they gave me permission to explore my own distinct approach to strip weaving using my own imagery by drawing and painting on the soft wood. I wanted the drawing and painting to be seen first and the weaving second. I wanted the work to hang more in the balance between drawing and textile. What is it? How do you categorize this? The fact that the work is constructed on wood helps to take it away from the textile a little more. And the harder material allows for it to come off the wall and become three-dimensional to stand alone as sculpture or screen. We can look more closely when we enter the gallery in a moment, but I must emphasize that the structure of the handwoven drawing is all happening within the weaving matrix of vertical threads running parallel to each other and then interlaced with the horizontal strips of the drawing on wood. All this happens on the loom. So when I first began weaving, I was enthralled with the warp threads just as they were on the loom because they were just like my installation work with the vertical and parallel lines. Who knew I had been practicing how to set up a loom while making the installations? Here's the handwoven drawing called Tamarack on the loom being made. I'm going to take some water just a second. <clears throat> Let's look here at the process of constructing the handwoven drawings from the beginning. First, I start by drawing on the soft, thin wood, usually bass, balsa, cherry, or birch. I use a variety of mediums to draw with, including acrylic paint, paint pens, ink, markers, graphite, silver point, metallic paints, metal leaf, basically whatever I need to create the imagery. Here I'm using a silver fork that I inherited to draw the hash marks and silver point. This work is a commission for a family foundation that was being passed down to a new generation. 
So I was thinking a lot about inheritance and legacies. Using the silver point seemed very appropriate for this work. Once the drawing is finished, as you see here, I cut the wood into narrow strips so that they can be woven into the warp threads, the vertical threads on the loom. Here you can see the strips and the loom behind. All the strips are cut by hand to mimic the natural fluctuations found in thread. After the imagery is cut into strips, I then weave it back together. It's hard to see, but here you can see the drawing being woven into the vertical threads that are attached to the loom. Weaving is basically a grid of vertical and horizontal threads that are interlaced together with the help of the loom. Theoretically, anything could be woven together. What's different here is that I'm weaving wood and thread to create an altered form of imagery, my very own iconography or graffiti, so to speak. Here's the finished diptych called Moments of Mitosis. This piece is eight feet by three feet. Here's a detail, and if you look closely, <laughs> I'll point this out in the gallery, you can see the pattern weave with the warp. There's chevrons and diamonds in there. Um, these patterns happen on the loom during the weaving process. So now we will move into my thinking about the title of this particular exhibition, Singulars. The work is an accumulation of many very specific images, moments, materials, and actions that are repeated in my mind and hands. Many little things are working together to create this work. Each one of these things is important in and of itself. Each singular item or action accumulates with all the others. A lot of repetition and energetic tedium create the works before you in the show. I impose rules on the work that give me both structure and allow for me to be surprised. Some things are predictable, others are not. There are a lot of mistakes to be dealt with. Trees in my work are sentries keeping watch. They are the main image and inspiration for the work. Trees are true to their time and place. Trees are indifferent and essential to all that is going on with humanity. They are one of our major resources linked to our survival. People play around with trees a lot. They are both omnipresent and frequently overlooked. I attempt to personify and anthropomorphize trees. They are characters in our story and help us tell our stories. When we fail, when our architecture and gardens are abandoned or ruined, they are at the ready to reclaim these sites for themselves. They thrive on our failure and inattention. Trees have a long view of history that can be a little threatening. They are tenacious in their growing and reproduction. They will survive after us and we cannot survive without them. One singular item is repeated many times to create something new and powerful. For example, here you have little dots and threads one thread is woven with many others to create textiles, which are also essential to our survival as human beings. All the vertical threads are parallel to each other, like I have emphasized. You can follow one vertical line over and under the entire length of the work. To get the effect I want, sometimes a single line in the drawing may require me to draw over that same line 10 or more times in the making of the work. This repetition is tedious and rewarding. Repeated images start to become something else in our imagination and personal associations. There is a slippage and opening up through the back and forth of seeming equal parts. The similarity to a Rorschach inkblot test is intentional. I want these images to be psychological and the response is something that could be analyzed and thought about psychologically. However, unlike a Rorschach test, these images have specific locations and addresses on a map. They are not abstract, nor are they a chance image. They're created from real places where people live and interact in their day-to-day -day lives. 
The homes and trees are the architecture where their lives are lived. To me, this is where our psychology re resides. It starts and develops in very specific addresses. Our psychology is held within ourselves and our cells reside in homes and amongst trees, insides and outsides. The trees in my work are ones that I have noticed and have had an attraction to or are in a special location for me. In this particular drawing, the trees are from a small rural village in Burkina Faso, West Africa, where I co-founded a weaving studio for women in 2007 that is still active today. The village is called Mantenga, and these are the, uh, the big baobab trees that are the gateway into the village. As I move toward closing this portion of the talk and getting ready to transition over to the gallery space, I'm going to share with you a couple more aspirational influences. <clears throat> I am part of a textile club with Gerhardt and Odell that has been an incredibly enriching and fulfilling addition to my life as an artist. One of our meetings took place at the University of Michigan where we got to see an incredibly inspiring collection of cashmere textiles. I could not get over the use of the center voids surrounding these incredible abstractions of flora and fauna. I felt my drawings and my handwoven drawings held a kinship with these textiles from Kashmir. Plus, I could look at them forever and everything that is going on within them. They are some of the most complicated and hard to figure out textiles I have ever seen. I am particularly attracted to these strange black voids. These became very popular in England and France where fashionable ladies wore these textile pieces as shawls, folded in half with the black voids around their necks. This drawing of mine called Cathedral is my discovering and creating the imagery of the cashmere textile while making it my own. I use my trees and the blue sky in the middle instead of a black, red, or white void of the traditional cashmere textiles. This magnificent one is in Nodell's collection. Another aspirational influence is Gaudí's architecture. I also cannot get enough of his work. Sagrada Familia is all about trees, flora, fauna, the gift of life and family. It's incredibly moving. For the sake of this talk, I will concentrate on one specific example of why I look to Gaudí as one of my teachers. This is an unfinished church in Santa Coloma near Barcelona that was centered in a textile producing town started by his patron, Guell. I'm attracted to the complexity of materials and structures to create the windows in particular. This church is not completed because they do not have the necessary drawings and models like they do for Sagrada Familia. Gaudí often designed on the spot with an incredible understanding of engineering that was inspired by natural structures. He was able to build upon his architecture, improving, Im improvising and engineering as it was developed. I consider him one of the most artistic architects. He collaborated with many experts and artisans to achieve his designs. Let's briefly look at, at everything that's going on to make this one window. There are so many layers here making this magical. The incredibly textured brickwork, brickwork is rough and natural and creates the overall shape and structure of the dormer. The metal lace-like window grates are made from recycled sewing needles from the town's textile factory. I find the metal grate in particular has an affinity to how the threads behave in my handwoven drawings. The mosaic frame around the glass is made from broken, colorful ceramics typical of daily life. Finally, you get to the stained and leaded glass in a floral and cross motif. All of these different elements are layered together to create this sensational window. I love its complexity 
with all its very singular and distinct elements. So this is very aspirational for me and what I am trying to do in my work. So I am a one woman show. I don't work with a large team of people, but not unlike Gaudi, I work with multiple elements in my pieces. The materials are wood, cotton, lurex, metallic threads, acrylic, ink, graphite, inkjet prints, metallic paint, silver point, metal leaf. The drawing is combined with the woven structure that is often woven in a complex pattern that overlays the drawing. There's a layering of visual experience and the hand woven drawings are installed to float away from the wall and they often glow a color from behind, giving them a sense of space. Shadows also play in projecting the work's basic structure on the wall behind. If a person takes the time, I hope I have rewarded their effort to look closely. In Belle Isle Tacoma Lake, you get an overall graphic impact, then get lost in the various details of thread structure, imagery, material, I often paint the threads after they are woven to create another effect. Here I painted the warp threads the same color of the red flowers so they would really pop. There is also a shimmer in the water created by mica flakes. In rouge, I embroidered with baker's twine on top of the weavings for added interest. I also painted the warp threads the fluorescent color of the trunks after the weaving came off the loom. Here I collaged a rocket into sky, in, in the sky that floats on top of the weaving using magnets. Collage elements are often of human things that are suspended between heaven and earth. Some of my latest works have become three-dimensional screens or sculptures. I draw on both sides of the wood and once woven, the sides can curve around and interact with the other side, depending on how it is arranged. The smaller sculptural works have more are more interactive in that they can be rearranged to a person's liking. They have the possibility of being changed and manipulated by the hands. As we move to the exhibition, I will conclude by simply reiterating that these works are artifacts of my lifetime pursuit and understanding the play between beauty and survival. So we can go to the gallery now. Thanks so much, Lynn. So we're gonna go ahead and get up and walk over to the other gallery. Those on Zoom, we're gonna say bye-bye. Um, bye, Zoom. Please, please come and, and see the show in person if you haven't had a chance to do so. Um, I'll be even more empowered to tell you about the pieces after, after our walkthrough. <laughs> so uh, thanks, and uh, let's take a look. And then I know some of you are here, uh, will be participating